witness an hour of the most shocking and most terrifying real-life gun battles ever caught on tape. The world's scariest police shootouts, next on Fox. Due to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. It's every police officer's worst nightmare. A moment he hopes will never come. A moment that could mean the difference between life and death. Tonight, on the world's scariest police shootouts. With more and more criminals armed with guns and willing to use them, being a cop has become an extremely dangerous job. To wear a badge these days takes more than a desire to protect and serve. You've got to have courage. Enough courage to stare down the barrel of a loaded gun. Suspect vehicle is moving. You are about to see the brave men and women of law enforcement as they encounter the scariest situation a police officer can face, a shootout. Cops coming from everywhere, and they were blowing shots all the way through. You will witness the most dramatic gun battles ever caught on tape during bank robberies, hostage situations, even in a high-speed chase. Firing. This is not a movie. Everything you are about to see is real. Good evening. I'm Sheriff John Bennell. Tonight you'll see police officers in their most dangerous moments on the job, during a shootout. I should know, I've been in several shootouts myself. There's no telling when a police officer will have to draw his weapon to uphold the law. Sometimes a shootout can erupt when you least expect it. Monroe, Georgia, 2.49 a.m. For Walton County Sheriff's Deputy Henry Bo Huff, this routine traffic stop will turn out to be anything but routine. Sir. Reading our stops, you're doing 88 miles an hour. 55. Ah! <laughs> Radio, just be shot! Deputy Huff is saved by his bulletproof vest, but the gunman gets away. Hours later, he is apprehended by police. It turns out he's a 15 year old boy joyriding in his grandmother's car. Hello, sir. Watch closely. Deputy Huff takes the full force of a 38 caliber bullet right in the chest. Took about three seconds to be over with, and I never knew what happened. If it hadn't been for the vest, I'd just be laying out on the road. Deputy Huff is only slightly injured. Since joining the Sheriff's Department, Huff has never gone out on patrol without wearing his vest. The reason I stopped you doing 88 miles an hour. On this night, the vest saved his life. I'm feeling very lucky. As you can see, got two bullet holes in a shirt. If it hadn't been for a vest, they would be in me. Radio, just be shot! Pomona, California. What you're about to see is a deadly combination. A shootout during a high-speed chase. The action is captured from above by helicopter pilot Bob Turr. Driver is now driving at uh, 65 miles an hour. Very dangerous situation. A Where gunman has carjacked a truck and ordered his driver to speed through traffic. The suspect is one of four men who just committed a home invasion robbery. In this situation, it was a hostage type thing. Uh, he had a suspect and he uh, was armed and dangerous. He'd already shot a police officer in Pomona and now he had a hostage in the vehicle. He pointed the gun at me and I said, you know, I don't want to die, I'll do what you want. With a gun to his head, the driver is forced to elude the police. The chase reaches speeds in excess of 80 miles an hour. The sirens are going, and we're, we're driving fast, we're going through stop signs, we're going through red lights. It's very dangerous pursuit at this point. We see the driver uh, drive up over the sidewalk through barriers and cutting narrowly, missing other vehicles. Okay, the suspect 
suspects now firing at the helicopter. Just reached his arm out, out the window and, and fired off two or three rounds, sat back in his seat, rolled up the window like it was, you know, nothing. <laughs> the suspect seems to be out of control, leaning out of the window, firing, or appear to be firing into some of the residents. Now he's firing at officer. The suspect is firing at officer. He would shoot out the window, and I would see the police car swerving from side to side. I would see them ducking down in their seats, and I also started to see people coming out, and there's bullets flying, and it, it got even more scary. I not only feared for myself, but for these families and the kids that were on the sides of the streets. This guy is out of control. I, I think that's a, a fair statement. An hour into the chase, the gunman orders his hostage to make an ill-advised turn. Right turn, right turn, right turn. What's happening here, cul-de-sac? Cul-de-sac, cul-de-sac. This is going to terminate right now. Dead end street. And I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, this is it. We're going to get down there. There's going to be a shootout. I'm going to be in the middle of this stuff, and, and who knows what can happen. The gunman jumps out of the truck and begins to flee on foot. Foot pursuit, foot pursuit. Suspect is running. The, uh, Still carrying a loaded pistol, he opens fire at police. He points the gun at me, and he fires two rounds. The first round goes between me and the car door. The second round goes over my head, towards my back. Uh, yeah, he was definitely shooting to kill me. Police return fire as the suspect heads deeper into the residential neighborhood. Watch closely as the officer's bullets narrowly miss the suspect. As I fired my first two rounds, I hit the rear end of the ground by his feet, and I could see the, the ground being chirped up. He then disappeared behind a wall on a fence. The suspect is still running, evading police officers. The gunman finally realizes he can't escape. He's got his hands raised. Suspect is giving himself up at this point. Suspect did drop. Police move in and apprehend the suspect. When he raised the gun to fire, yeah, he was definitely shooting to kill me. There was no question in my mind. Wilmington, Ohio. An ordinary traffic stop for two state troopers quickly becomes one of the most explosive gun battles ever caught on tape. The action is captured on a video camera positioned inside the trooper squad car. It begins simply enough with the troopers pulling over a Suburban for driving with expired tags. Say you borrowed the vehicle? As the trooper questions the driver, the passenger remains in the vehicle. Unbeknownst to the trooper, the Suburban is packed with a large arsenal of illegal weapons. Okay, so hey, wait a minute. Right Any now, guns, knives, no. clubs, stuff hey, like that on here, sir? Going, I don't want you going and searching through all my stuff. I'm not searching through your stuff, no, sir. I'm, I'm going to put you in my car. Right. Clearly, the suspect has something to hide. No, but I don't want to be violated like this. All right, sir, then I'll arrest you for not having a driver's license, and then I'll, then I'll search you, and then I'll put you in jail. Now, how do you want to play it? At this point, the driver runs back to his vehicle. The passenger, later identified as his brother, jumps out of the car and pulls out a semi-automatic handgun. Fortunately, neither trooper is injured, but both suspects manage to make their getaway. The suspects are later identified as Chevy and Shane Kehoe, suspected members of a white supremacist group. It was Shane Kehoe who fired his handgun at the troopers. Although the trooper gets off several shots at close range, it seems impossible that Shane Kehoe isn't hit. The video tells the real story. So you borrowed the vehicle? When Chevy Kehoe walks back to the squad car, he is simply trying to divert the trooper's attention. Watch as Shane Kehoe puts on what officers believe to be a bulletproof vest. Now look at the gunfight again. It is thought that Shane Kehoe was actually shot three times, but his vest stops the trooper's bullets. Later in the day, another trooper spots Chevy Kehoe. Kehoe jumps out of his car and fires 26 rounds at the squad car before fleeing again. A search of the Suburban reveals enough weapons and ammunition to equip a small army. Considered armed and very dangerous, Chevy and Shane Kehoe are still on the run. Coming up next, police move in as a deranged gunman threatens to kill a terrified hostage, his wife. He was 
was using deadly force against her, and we needed to stop that action. A Texas trooper fights for his life in a highway shoot. Oh my God! Gunfire erupts when police raid the home of a suspected drug dealer. And later, all units at the Bank of America stay down. Shots are being fired. Automatic fire. The biggest gun battle ever caught on tape. The sound of the gunfire was death to me. speed chase involving vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle gunfire comes to an end when the armed suspect flips his car. Police move in, but the gunman has a hostage, his wife. I see the two people get out of the car. I'm saying to myself, this is interesting. Nobody appears to be hurt. Then I see the man with the gun holding the woman. Now everybody is really dialed in. I'm taking cover behind my car. The man's obviously armed. The terrifying ordeal began 48 hours earlier, when the suspect shot his wife's friend, Lucy Valdez, after a heated argument. He was mad because she left him, and he, he had been begging her to go back home. He wanted to kill the baby, kill Gloria himself, and probably all of us in here. Two days after Lucy was shot, the suspect is spotted by the Utah Highway Patrol. A high-speed chase ensues. We picked up some radio traffic of a pursuit coming southbound out of Davis County. The radio traffic said that it may be a hostage type situation. He made a maneuver which caused him to lose control of his vehicle and he rolled it. As we were pulling up to that area, all we could see was a cloud of dust. Cars rolled over, you might want to roll medical this way. He's yelling at us quite a bit. He's kind of taken cover for himself with her by his side between the upside-down car and our position. The suspect appears agitated and begins to point his weapon in the direction of the officers. I don't know what his thought process was, but I know at a certain point, he decided this is where it's going to end. The subject has his back towards that frontage road, and he will shoot. Then, without warning, the suspect turns the gun on his wife. And everybody is holding their breath, going, I didn't see this, but I just saw this. He continues to shoot at his wife. The police are forced to take action. He was using deadly force against her, and we needed to stop that action. We're taught to use deadly force in the defense of others, in the defense of ourselves, and that's why we uh, acted in the manner that we did. The suspect later dies of his wounds. His wife is airlifted to a local hospital. Miraculously, she survives. Minneapolis, Minnesota. As police converge on the home of a suspected drug dealer, one of the officers captures the action on his personal camcorder. A canister of tear gas is fired into the house. As officers break down the door, the gunman opens fire. Amazingly, no one is hurt, and the suspect and his wife are taken into custody. January 23, 1991, one of the most infamous dates in the history of Texas law enforcement. Constable Darrell Lunsford pulls over three suspicious men and asks to search the trunk of their car. While Lunsford questions the suspects, one of them grabs his legs and throws him off balance. Another suspect then wrestles Lunsford to the ground, where he is kicked and beaten. One of the men gets hold of Lunsford's gun and fatally shoots the 47-year-old officer. It is a tragic death, but one that is not in vain. 
A short time later, another Texas trooper watches the tape of the Lunsford murder. He studies every frame and learns from it. When we saw Daryl Lunsford's video, uh, it did save my life. It, hel it helped me out quite a bit. He was a good police officer, real good police officer. It's unfortunate that things happened and turned out the way they did, but it put me in, in a different mode to be alert. Eight months pass. With the murder of Constable Lunsford still fresh in his mind, Trooper Lopez pulls over a car carrying three men. As I walked up to the car, I noticed that the backseat passenger gave me a particular stare, almost like if he was scared of something or, or just apprehensive about something. Trooper Lopez speaks with the suspects in Spanish. And I asked what they had in the trunk. I said, well, y'all mind if I look in the trunk? And they said, no, go ahead. The front seat passenger was adamant about wanting to get out of the car for some reason. I think they realized, well, he's going to find out what, what they're trying to conceal. I got a strong odor of uh, a detection of marijuana, which was emitting from inside the trunk area. The other two men get out of the car. Now watch how closely Trooper Lopez comes to getting killed. The suspect reaches for his gun. Lopez sees this, shoves the suspect, and takes evasive action. All I could think of was drawing my gun. But at the same time, I'm thinking, let me gain a little distance between him and myself. Lopez's quick thinking enables him to avoid certain death. Amazingly, while running away from the gunman, Lopez is able to draw his weapon and fire. His first shot finds its target. Oh my God! The gunman is merely wounded, and the gunfight rages on. The other two suspects escape into the night. Lopez continues to shoot it out with the suspect, then takes cover in the darkness before making his way back to a squad car. Another trooper responds to his call for backup. Suddenly, Lopez spots the gunman in his rearview mirror. I see him behind my patrol car. So I threw the, the microphone down and, and, and went after him again. Listen as another gun battle erupts. Miraculously, Trooper Lopez isn't seriously injured in the shootout. Despite the number of shots fired, he is grazed only once. The suspect isn't as lucky. A manhunt ensues through the night and into the next day. Police eventually capture the other two suspects. When we return, a suspected car thief makes the mistake of shooting it out with the cops. He left us no choice. A robbery is foiled by SWAT firepower. It was like hell. A shootout erupts in a neighborhood grocery store. A tense standoff in the police department's very own parking lot. To have a man show up with two guns, cowboy style, in your parking lot is just not something we train for. When police officers are forced to fight back against armed and dangerous criminals, they're hailed as heroes. But these brave men and women don't consider themselves to be anything special. For them, it's all part of the job. Phoenix, Arizona. A high-speed pursuit is about to turn violent as a suspected car thief tries to outrun the police. It was apparent right away that he wasn't going to stop for us. He was swerving in and out of traffic. We tried a couple of times with officers to get around him and he would swerve towards their cars. Officers of the Arizona Department of Public Safety placed tire-piercing spikes in the road ahead. The suspect's car is disabled and forced off the highway. But he had been going about 70 when he got close to the spikes. He accelerated to about 90 miles an hour and, and ran over the spikes. The suspect can be seen ducking behind his vehicle as officers approach. 
Suddenly, he steps back into view, wielding a pistol. Drop the weapon now! The officers reload their weapons and cautiously approach the injured suspect. Shots fired, suspect was down, I was involved in the shooting. I want to advise the provider. Watch again as the suspect takes aim at the police. At that time, everybody could see that he had a gun in his hand and uh, unfortunately pointed the gun at the officers. And uh, he was given a command several times to drop the gun and just wouldn't do it. It was a suspect's choice to do what he did, and he left us no choice. He was given the opportunity to surrender, and he didn't do that. The suspect is rushed to a nearby hospital. He lives to stand trial for his crimes. Thornwood, New York. Just before closing, three armed gunmen enter a neighborhood supermarket. An alert security guard monitoring the store's surveillance cameras calls 911. That wasn't police sergeant Finelli. Yes, this is a robbery in progress right now in shop right here. Armed. What are they armed with? One has a shotgun, two of them with handguns. One of the suspects terrorizes store employees in the cashier's office. Telling the manager to open the safe. They're attempting to force the manager to open the safe at this time. Another suspect raids a cash drawer. While well, the third stands watch at the front door. Be advised, the suspect at the door is armed with a shotgun. Minutes after the frantic call from the security guard, the police arrive. Let's go and take him. They're moving out. I think he's seen you. I think he's seen a cop. Oh, they're panicking. They're panicking. One is in the back of the store. The suspects attempt to escape. The last one drags a bag of money behind him. Police officer Glenn Carlson is first on the scene and fires two rounds at the fleeing robbers. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah, were there any shots fired in there? Yes, an officer shot fired. As I entered past the uh, checkout line, yes, one of the suspects spun on me, pointed the handgun at me. I, I fired two shots uh, at that point, missing the suspect. Sergeant Carlson chases the robbers to the back of the store. And as I went out that rear door, uh, they fired upon me. Um, I, I hesitated for a moment. I returned fire. One of the suspects remains hidden in the supermarket. He is spotted by a store employee. Yeah, we have that suspect in custody. His two accomplices are caught outside. Oh, man, what a night, man. None of the customers or employees are seriously injured, and all three suspects are soon behind bars. We have to understand that, you know, these things can happen. They do happen, uh, and when they do, we have to do our job. Tampa, Florida. A local television station receives an anonymous tip that a bank robbery is about to take place. The station's weather camera catches all the action. It was apparent they were going to do a bank robbery, and our SWAT team confronted them. Uh, there was a shootout. We had four to five officers that fired shots. Unaware that the SWAT team has been trailing them for weeks, the bank robbers pull up. But police have already locked the doors and blocked their escape route. A gun battle ensues. It was like the OK it was Corral. Like the OK they Corral. started at the front of the bank, and they were blowing shots all the way through. The one uh, dude got over here. They were still shooting, took him down right there. Cops coming from everywhere. I have never seen anything like that. That's my first time ever seeing it. I'm still shaking from it. They was pursuing them all across over there. They was down. I thought I seen them shooting over there. It was like hell. Police try to disorient the robbers with concussion grenades. But the suspects keep moving. The police have no choice but to open fire. The shootout continues as the suspects run around the side of the bank. It was perfect. When these people jumped out of the car and uh, ran to the door and hit that locked door, I personally would have loved to have seen the look on their face. Two of the three suspects drop their guns and surrender. The third is taken down by the SWAT team. Shelby, North Carolina. A dangerous standoff is developed in the parking lot of the city's police department. It is one man with two guns against dozens of officers. To have a man show up with two guns, cowboy style, in your parking lot is just not something we trained for. The bizarre incident began down the street at the Social Security office. 
There, the suspect held up an armed guard at gunpoint and stole his revolver. Shelby Police Captain Shell Byers is one of the first to be confronted by the suspect. Had a 38 in his left hand, had a 357 in his right hand, and he pointed the 38 directly at me, and at that time I thought he was going to kill me. Moments later, the man is surrounded. Realizing that he is outgunned, he simply kneels on the asphalt, waving his two pistols in the air. Police negotiators try their best to talk the man into dropping his weapons. Although we were attempting, there was very little dialogue between the suspect and the police. The standoff has now lasted for 39 minutes, and the police have made no progress with the gunman. Then suddenly, the suspect discharges his weapon. The police return fire. For the officers of the Shelby Police Department, the ending is not a happy one. It's, it's the last situation that a law enforcement officer would want to be in. And uh, out of my career, I've, I've never wanted to take anybody's life. And I just hope and pray to God that I never have to, because it's something that you don't want to do. Still to come. I get you three of them, four of them then. A frightening hostage situation comes to a violent end. And then... The suspect is moving northbound in the parking lot. The suspect is behind a white vehicle in the parking lot. 350 cops shoot it out with two heavily armed bank robbers. Go for the legs. They don't have body armor on their legs. Sacramento, California. Police are called when shots are fired inside a busy electronics store. Four gang members are holding 41 frightened hostages at gunpoint, many of them children. This situation would soon turn into one of the most terrifying gun battles in the city's history. Inside, the heavily armed gunmen are demanding $4 million and safe transportation to their home country of Thailand. They also want bulletproof vests. A police sergeant strips down to his underwear to prove he's not armed and hands over his vest. A hostage retrieves the vest. Moments later, she and her two children are released. Later, another woman and her children are allowed to leave. Night falls, and the terrorists warn that they will begin shooting hostages if their demands are not met. Mostly the threats were just uh, uh, to kill us, actually. Uh, and, and initially they were very reasonable. But uh, about 6 o'clock, as uh, deadline after deadline passed, they got, uh, you know, the uh, tension rose. They got more and more panicked. The standoff has now lasted for more than six hours. And the gunmen are losing their patience. The hostages are tied and positioned to serve as human shields. Stop shooting. I get you three of them, four of them, Danny. I told you. Shoot them on the leg right now, and then, I, and, and then I'll ask you again. You say, no, I killed them. I told you that as soon as they are coming outside, uh, I will okay, give you Okay, okay, I'll shoot them right now. Just please. No, why do that? Okay, then. Just let them go, and the vest is coming. I just broke his leg right there. One lucky hostage is allowed to leave. Yeah. He's telling him to go right through. now. He's leaving right now. Turn to the left. He's leaving right now. Okay. Okay, so... Another hostage volunteers to be shot in the leg in exchange for his freedom. Okay. In return, he must restate the terrorist ultimatum to the police and the media. Meet our demands, or the hostages will die. How do you do? Hello? Hello. Who is okay, what happened? Um, you shot him in the leg. Who and did? One of the gunmen. Hey, can you tell me which one, or would you rather not? Number two. Number two. Mm -hmm. That's the, the guy that uh, is always angry. Yes. Nearly eight hours into the siege, negotiators agree to give the gunman another flak jacket. No, I'm the boss. When I say send them out, you send them out. A female hostage is tethered with electrical cord and sent outside to retrieve the vest. The SWAT team knows that the gunmen are just minutes away from executing the hostages. A police sniper fires, but misses the hooded gunman. A flash grenade explodes and a hostage escapes.
In the chaos, the SWAT team rushes through the rear of the store. A gunfight erupts with the four gang members. After it began, the crisis is finally over. Three of the four gang members are dead. In a SWAT situation, sometimes you don't have any alternative. The person will put you in a position where you have to use deadly force. Uh, I haven't spoken with anyone in my business that really wants to use deadly force, but it's an alternative and the last alternative that you have to save your life or someone else's life. My first reaction was that I was dead. He was going to shoot me and, and I would die. At a Wells Fargo bank in Buena Park, California, Paul Wing, an off-duty police officer, finds himself face-to-face -face with an armed bank robber with a violent past. The action is captured on a surveillance camera. The suspect came in the bank behind me. He walked right next to me as he went to the access way to where the tellers were. Uh, he was announcing that it was a robbery. And he actually threatened to kill the tellers if they didn't comply with his orders. My design at that point was to be a witness, to try to be the best witness I could and not take any action. Uh, I didn't want to unnecessarily endanger anyone inside the bank. He lowered his gun down the line of tellers, and I suspected he was going to shoot the teller. And at that point, I didn't feel I had any other options but to draw and fire. Officer Wing's first bullet strikes the gunman in the chest, but does not stop him. Officer Wing is now in a fight for his life. The round struck him in the chest cavity and knocked him back maybe a half a step. Both of his arms went up and he fired around in the air. He started to bring the gun down towards me and I tried to shoot him again, but my gun had jammed. He started firing at me at that point. I was extremely scared. My first fear was that he would kill me. As bullets whiz within inches of Officer Wing's body, he struggles to his feet and somehow gets his hands on the bank robber's gun. I grabbed a hold of the gun barrel and he began striking me in the head with his free hand. As Officer Wing fights for the gun, the bank robber pulls the trigger. Fortunately, Officer Wing is not hit. After gaining control of the weapon, Officer Wing chases his assailant out of the bank and finally apprehends him in the parking lot. I've thought about it myself. I thought at that particular time it was the right thing to do. He made the move that forced me into taking action. I really felt he was going to kill somebody. Knoxville, Tennessee. After a local bank is robbed, police trail the suspects to this home. The situation quickly turns into a tense standoff as the armed suspects barricade themselves inside. After police move into position, a female suspect gives up. Moments later, another suspect surrenders, but a lone gunman remains inside the house. He exchanges gunfire with the police. One officer is shot in the arm and stomach and is rushed to a local hospital. As more shots ring out, police begin to carefully evacuate the neighborhood. Still, the gunman refuses to come out. Okay, come on out, Donnie. Come on out. Keep your hands up where you can see them. I talked to him uh, at the beginning, and then I turned it over to uh, one of our hostile negotiators, and then I started up again uh, towards the end there just to see if we could get him out. Police fire a series of tear gas bombs into the house. Did not respond uh, at all to any of our uh, calls for him to come out of the house. Uh, after a point then, uh, right around 12-15, uh, our SWAT team started shooting canisters of tear gas in the house, and he re uh, replied by firing his uh, shotgun out the window several times at our officers. The standoff is into its fourth hour when the gunman comes out of the house, now threatening to kill himself. A sharpshooter takes aim and fires, striking the suspect's gun. The man checks his weapon, sees that it is damaged, and tosses it away. Now look again. The bullet hits his gun. His arm recoils. He inspects his weapon. 
then wisely surrenders. You train and you train uh, for days like this, and although you never really expect them to, to happen, uh, sometimes they do, and, and fortunately, uh, you know, the things that we've been taught to do, uh, we did today. Up next. He left us no other recourse but to stop his actions. Police open fire when a gunman tries to carjack a vehicle. Drop it, drop it, drop it. An armed standoff ends in a hail of gunfire. Plus, watch crossfire. Units watch the crossfire. The world's scariest police shooter. Newcastle, Indiana. State Trooper Mark McDougall is about to join the high-speed pursuit of a wanted felon. The driver has just robbed a bank of more than $5,000. He is armed and dangerous. We're at front. The subject in the blue Ford Mustang, the robbery at Citizens Bank. He is now eastbound. Subject refused to stop at this time. Passing lane have four units now. Just ahead, deputies have set up a barricade. The suspect soon finds his escape route blocked. As vehicles stack up, the suspect veers to the right and jumps out of his getaway car. Then he points a 45 caliber handgun at the nearest motorist. Police open fire. I fired three times. I didn't have time to aim, but I knew I'd hit him because he kind of stumbled and fell over the car and around to the other side of the car. Brenda Johnson and her two children found themselves face to face with the crazed gunman. I instinctively locked on my car doors and uh, when I heard his first shot, I covered my head and kind of put my head down a little bit. And the next time I looked up, he was on the opposite side of my car and then I lost sight of him and I pulled off. Shook up a little bit, but we're all okay. The woman's life was in danger and her children were in danger. He left us no other recourse but to stop his actions. Subject is in custody, shots were fired. If it weren't for the rapid response of the Indiana State Troopers, the outcome might have been tragic for Brenda and her two children. You know, I wish it didn't happen, but uh, she's alive today and that makes me feel real good. Charlotte, North Carolina. Inside this home, a man is barricaded with a gun. He has already threatened to kill his father. Pleas from both his parents and the police go unheeded. The desperate man has fired his weapon three times. Police negotiators try to talk some sense into him, but he refuses to listen. After more than four hours, the negotiators are finally able to coax the man out on his porch, but he still won't lay down his gun. The police restate their position. Drop the weapon before someone gets hurt. The gunman doesn't realize that a SWAT team is just a few feet away, positioned around the corner of the house. Still pointing his gun, the man walks towards the officers. When he sees them, he raises his weapon to fire. The police have no choice but to defend themselves. In a matter of seconds, the standoff is over. When somebody makes an election to point a gun at a police officer, we don't require the officer to wait for the person to fire the gun. That person has told the officer they represent a deadly threat. They held their fire until the very last moment when he was clearly getting ready to, and in fact did, point the weapon at the officers. At that point, it's a matter of their life or his. <laughs> February 28, 1997, North Hollywood, California, scene of the largest gunfight ever caught on tape. 1,100 rounds of armored piercing bullets are fired, nine officers are shot, seven civilians are injured. I did not think that I was going to get out of there alive. But thanks to the bravery of countless Southern California police officers, no one is killed, except the two bank robbers. After locking
trafficking more than 30 hostages in the bank's vault, the two gunmen try to make their getaway. They start yelling and screaming, everybody down, you know, and they start shooting all over the place. But they're surprised by police. The gunmen open fire, spraying bullets at anything in their way. Jorge Vieira, a Spanish-speaking reporter for Telemundo Television, is one of the first to arrive on the scene. There were bullets everywhere. Jorge spots one of the gunmen, but mistakes him for a cop. We didn't know where the bullets were coming from or what was happening or anything. Not realizing that they are in extreme danger, they barricade themselves close to the bank robber. Jorge continues to report on the robbery, fully aware that this newscast may be his last. When I heard the bullet that hit behind the pool, at that moment I was pretty scared. I started thinking, well, I'm going to get killed. Several police officers are wounded. Helicopters catch the terrifying scene from above. They too become moving targets. Amidst the chaos and horror, Dr. Jorge Montes treats two injured officers when they duck through the front door of his dental office. I see the two officers on the floor, and they start screaming away, who's a doctor, who's a doctor? And I say, I'm the doctor. He said, help me, I've been shot, I've been shot. Tracy Fisher is on her way back from the ATM when she is caught in the crossfire. The sound of the gunfire was death to me. While huddled behind a squad car, she is shot in the foot. And it knocked my feet out from under me. I mean, I, I hit the pavement. The suspect is moving northbound in the parking lot. The suspect is behind the white vehicle in the parking lot. The gunmen continue their assault. While one suspect drives, the other walks calmly beside the vehicle, blasting everything in sight. He goes about 10 yards, turn around, caps off, they're going to clip around at us. The return barrage of police gunfire is deflected by the bank robber's body armor. Uh, I don't know how many times, but the heavy, heavy body armor... He's not knocking down at all. Watch closely as the gunman lurches forward, a police round literally bouncing off of him. Go for the legs. They don't have body armor on their legs. The quick-thinking police borrow high-powered weapons from a neighborhood gun shop and take the offensive when the gunman split up, shooting only a pistol. The gunman on foot is finally outgunned. In a burst of gunfire, his weapon is shot from his grasp. Then the gunman goes down. The second bank robber heads into the residential neighborhood. Families take cover inside their homes as he attempts to hijack passing motorists. Calmly, methodically, the suspect transfers his weapons into the pickup. When the truck won't start, the police make their move. The gunman opens fire at the police. The officers return fire. Then, a direct hit by police. The suspect has fired his final shot. Calm is once again restored. One suspect on Archwood is in custody. The residents of North Hollywood will never forget this day. They will certainly never forget the brave officers who gallantly risked their lives. Hearing the officers' voices, knowing that they knew we were there, meant a lot to me. It made me feel that I wasn't alone. And what was so courageous to me is even though they were obviously in pain and, and bleeding and, and in danger, they were still concerned for the partners down below and still concerned for us, the, the civilians. Because of the great job that the policeman did, I believe that that's why nobody got killed, only the suspects. World's scariest police shootouts will return in a moment. Fortunately, most police officers will never have to risk their lives in a shootout. But if an armed suspect chooses to brandish a deadly weapon, we must be willing to use whatever means are necessary to protect innocent lives. For the world's scariest police shootouts, I'm Sheriff John Bunnell. Good night.